Hello everyone. Welcome to MBBS classes. Myself, Dr. Hanifa. Today in this video, I'll be talking on recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. In short, it is also called as RRP or the other name of the disease is the juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis. This recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, it is a rare clinical condition of the larynx and the airway and it is commonly known as juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis. This disease, it is a benign neoplasm of the larynx and the etiology is a virus. The type is human papilloma virus, the subtypes being the 6 and 11. That is, the HPV 6 and 11 are found to be commonly associated with the recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. It is characterized by the proliferation of benign squamous papillomas within the aerodigestive tract. Even though it is a rare entity, it is the most common benign neoplasms of the larynx in children and moreover, it is one of the common cause of hoarseness in the pediatric population. The disease is different from the other benign diseases. The reason is it is difficult to treat. Now let's see what are the reasons which makes it difficult to treat. The reasons are it has the tendency to recur. Then it has the tendency to spread throughout the respiratory tract. That means it may not be limited to the one area. It, there may be the multiple foci focus of the papillomas in the different areas of the respiratory tract. The third reason being is as it recurs at frequent interval, the patient needs frequent surgical removal of the uh, papillomas. So the patient may need Multiple procedures, not over a year, it may involve, it may span over the period of years. Sometimes, if it involves the multiple sites and when it involves the narrow airways, it may lead to the fatal consequences like strider and the respiratory distress in some of the cases. And it is seen that why it is difficult to treat is that in some of the patients, it may show malignant transformation. Now let's see the epidemiology of the disease. It, as we know that this disease is caused by the virus that is the human papilloma virus type 6 and 11. If we see the age group which is affected, it affects more commonly the children but it may affect the adults also. So there are two types of the disease which is described. The, there are two types. The first is the juvenile type or it is the aggressive form of the disease which is which is found in the children. The, there is a second subtype that is the adult type and this adult type of the uh, respiratory papillomatosis, it is a less aggressive than the juvenile type. If we see the transmission, exact mode is not known but the maternal to the fetal transmission is proposed mechanism in the juvenile type of the respiratory papillomatosis. In children, the disease is thought to get acquired through the vertical transmission during the delivery through the infected birth canal. And if we see the relation of the onset of the disease with the age of the patient, it is seen that younger the age of presentation, more the number of surgical procedures the patient will need and more is the probability of involvement of the multiple sites. So it is seen that in the juvenile type, the patients, they, they, it, since it recurs, the patient needs multiple uh, procedures and it involves the multiple sites of the larynx and the airway. But in adults, the papillomas are usually in one side and they don't recur much. That means they have a less aggressive behavior. Now let's see the difference between the two subtypes. The juvenile type, it is called as juvenile type when the disease presents before the 12 years of age. On the other way around, this RRP is considered to be adult onset if the patients, if it presents in the patients older than 60 to 20 years of age. The most common age group in the adult group which is affected is the 30 to 50 years of age. So we know that the juvenile type is the aggressive form. So it involves the multiple sites of the larynx and the trachea. On the other way around, the adult type, it usually occurs as a single papilloma which will be smaller in size and the most common site which is involved in the adult type is the anterior half of the vocal cord or the anterior commissure. 
if we see the gender distribution the juvenile type they show equal male and female predilection but in the adult type the males are seen to be affected more than the females the juvenile type it involves the infants and the young children and it is seen that it is it happens more to the first born when the mother is infected and when the mother and when they belong to the poor socio economic conditions if we go to the by the nature of the disease the juvenile is more aggressive disease it has a tendency to recur while on the other way round the adult is less aggressive and it doesn't recur after the surgical removal now let's see the virology of the human papilloma virus the human papilloma virus it belongs to the papilloma viridae family which is a dna containing virus the nature of this human papilloma virus is that it is epitheliotropic that means it has more liability to infect the epithelial cells the subtypes which cause the disease more commonly are the subtype 6 and 11 but sometimes the human papilloma virus 16 and 18 are also associated with the disease it is seen that the in children who are infected with the human papilloma virus 11 they are found to have more obstructive type of disease that means the bulk of the disease is too much and they produce, they present with the more obstructive symptoms uh, than the voice symptoms how does this virus causes the disease it is seen that the human papilloma virus it induces the cellular proliferation it activates the epithelial growth factor which results in the proliferation of the infected epithelial cells now let's see the clinical presentation of the disease in the juvenile and the adult type the symptoms they vary in these two subtypes in juvenile type that is in the children they may present with a wide variety of the laryngeal symptoms it may be hoarseness stridor respiratory distress the type of the symptoms depends on the location and the bulk of the disease that is you may find one child presenting with a strider and you may uh, find an another child is presenting only with the hoarseness so it is the site and it is the bulk of the disease which determines the presentation of the patient now let's see the hoarseness hoarseness it is the principal presenting symptom in rrp involving the vocal folds so and it is seen that when the disease is bulky and when it involves a narrow airway the child may present to you as the strider and the strider it is the second clinical symptom to develop in the beginning the strider is inspiratory type and later it may become biphasic in nature some of the children uh, some of the infants they may present as acute respiratory distress the reason is they have the small airway dimension the other symptoms of the juvenile onset rrp uh, may be chronic cough recurrent pneumonia failure to thrive dyspnea and sometimes dysphagia also on the other way round the clinic the most common presenting symptom in the adult onset papillomatosis is dysphonia if we see the course of the disease in juvenile uh, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis it is not same in all the children in some it may undergo spontaneous remission and will remain in a stable condition but in some of the patients it may have a waxing and the waning type of clinical course that means sometimes it flares up then it comes down and again after a period of time it will show the symptoms in in the in the third group of the patients it may become extremely aggressive requiring the frequent surgical treatment as this disease it produces laryngeal and the airway symptoms it may be misunderstood or confused with the diseases like asthma croup bronchitis and vocal nodules in adults so whenever you are, uh, you are getting a patient of hoarseness and the strider always keep in mind the other differential diagnosis too so whenever we are uh, examining a patient the key steps of diagnosing any disease starts with the history taking followed by the clinical examination and in the diseases involving the airway uh, the airway endoscopy must be done remember in the history taking of the rrp remember one thing that the most consistent sign and symptoms of rrp in children is the persistent 
or progressive strider and dysphonia which may be associated or may not be associated with the development of respiratory distress. Hoarseness is a common laryngeal symptom of the RRP and hoarseness is present early when the papilloma involves the vocal cords and when the papilloma in, is far away from the vocal cords, the hoarseness may present as a late symptom. A patient presenting to you with the strider and respiratory distress always it is suggesting a glottis or a subglottic lesions. The other uh, points which must be uh, taken uh, into account while taking the history taking is that the history of airway trauma and intubation, the characteristic of the cry of the baby, the mother must be asked in details, the, any associated feeding difficulties or any allergic symptoms may help in differentiating it from the alternative diagnosis. Now whom to investigate? Not every child with the hoarseness needs investigation. So what are the cases we need to investigate? So remember if a child is presenting to you with the slowly progressive hoarseness then investigate those group of patients. Moreover when the hoarseness is present with the other symptoms like respiratory distress, tachypnea, tachycardia, cyanosis, dysphagia, failure to thrive and recurrent pneumonia. So these are the two group of patients who needs investigations. After the history taking comes the physical examination. So in this case, the, I'll just go through the important points related to the disease. So the respiratory rate and the degree of distress must be evaluated. Look for any tachypnea, whether the child is having any flaring of the nasal ala or any use of accessory muscles in the chest muscles, which means that the child is in respiratory distress. Signs like cyanosis, air hunger, onset of fatigue, they point towards the impending respiratory failure. We must auscultate the chest also and the pulse oximetry must always be done because this pulse oximetry, it gives us an objective information on the child's respiratory status. Please note down the characteristic of the strider also. In, it is seen that the strider of laryngeal origin, they are musical in nature. Then while examining, also look for any change in the nature of the strider with the change in the position of the patient. Because if a strider is due to RRP, it will not show any change in character with the change in the position of the child. But if the strider is due to laryngomalacia or vascular ring or any other mediastinal mass, it will show the change with the change in the position of the child. If a child is too sick or if the child is in respiratory distress, it is better to examine the patient in the operation room or the intensive care unit where there is a backup facility for the resuscitation and tracheotomy if needed. Airway endoscopy gives us a clear picture of the description of the disease. It is best done with the flexible fiber optic nasopharyngoscope and in children the endoscopy is preferred to be done under the general anesthesia. The characteristic uh, picture of the papillomas on the, larynx, on the laryngoscopy it looks like glistening white irregular exophytic growth or verrucous type of growth which may be sessile, which may be pedunculated. It is friable and it bleeds easily. So you can see here the papillomas they are involving the both sides of the vocal cords. So this is how it looks in the laryngoscopy. Apart from the type of the growth we must know what are the sites involved of the airway to know about the extent of the disease. Now coming to the treatment options in RRP, remember that even though it is a benign disease, till date no single modality is found to be effective in the eradication of RRP. The current standard of treatment is surgical removal of papillomas. Our aim of the treatment in RRP always remains to maintain the adequate airway and the functional voice preservation. Now let's see what are the surgical options. The surgical debridement or the debulking or removal of the papillomas can be done using the cold steel instruments or the uh, removal can also be done with the help of the CO2 laser. 
Traditionally, it has been the surgical workhorse for the treatment of RR pain. Nowadays, uh, there is another type of laser called the pulse laser or the KTP laser lasers, which has an added advantage over the CO2 laser. These KTP lasers are the photoangiolytic lasers. That is, with the hemoglobin sensitivity, these KTP lasers they selectively coagulate the vascular stock feeding the papillomas. The advantage of KTP laser over the CO2 laser is that it can be done as an office procedure or the OPD procedure, thereby avoiding the need of the general anesthesia. And moreover, it is seen that the scarring is less and in comparison to the CO2 lasers. Then the debridement can also be done with the help of another powered instrument called the micro debrider. Tracheotomy sometimes may be needed in some of the cases when the child is having severe respiratory distress. Then the another modality of treatment or you can say an additional treatment which may be given in RRP is the adjuvant therapy. But, a way, but the role of adjuvant therapy is still under trial and because it needs extensive randomized controlled trials, a variety of adjuvant therapies have been reported and these are advised when the surgery itself cannot control the disease. When you see that the child is uh, the child is requiring multiple number of surgical procedures and in spite of that the disease is coming back it is too bulky in amount then we need to consider addition of the adjuvant therapy the advantage of adding the adjuvant therapy is that uh, there are studies which are showing that it increases the time interval between the surgical procedures a variety of adjuvant therapy have been reported but none is approved so let's see the first adjuvant therapy which was uh, given to the patient was the interferon alpha it was the first systemic adjuvant therapy the interferons are the proteins which are released from the leukocytes in response to the stimuli like viral infections the other adjuvant therapies which uh, are also tried in some of the places they are intralesional these are like intralesional uh, administration of cedofobir vivacizumab and the pd1 inhibitor that is the programmed cell death protein inhibitor this cedofobir it is a cytosine uh, cytosine nucleotide analog that blocks the replication of these dna viruses the advantage is that since it, it can be given intralesionally, it has a limited systemic toxicity. Then this bevacizumab, it is a recombinant, recombinant monoclonal humanized antibodies that blocks the angiogenesis by inhibiting the human vascular endothelial growth factor A. The last adjuvant therapy which is also tried is the PDP1 inhibitor. This PD1 inhibitor is the present on the surface of the leukocytes. It negatively regulates the immune system. So there are so many therapies which are tried but none is till now approved till date. So to conclude, although the RRP it is a benign disease, it is a chronic disease that is difficult to manage because of its aggressive nature and its tendency to recur. Even with the recent advances, RRP is not completely curable with the current treatment modalities. With this, I come to an end of this video. Thank you for watching this video.